Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dave Vitito. I'm the Executive Director of Alumni Relations at John Carroll University, and I'm also a member of the class of 2000. On behalf of our interim president, our president-elect, faculty, staff, and students, welcome to John Carroll, and welcome to the DiCarlo Varsity Center Gymnasium. To Rita, Debbie, Tony Jr., Patty, Gary, and the entire DiCarlo family. For the past few years, we've been thinking of you. And for the past few days, we've been grieving with you. And today, we celebrate a life well lived. We celebrate a man who, over 50 years of affiliation with this institution, has impacted countless lives and left a mark on future generations. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers today who I'm honored to introduce to you. And I'm also honored that the family asked me to share maybe one story, one anecdote. I knew Tony DiCarlo as my football coach, a larger than life figure roaming the sidelines. And years later, he served as a major gift officer in our advancement division. So when I returned to John Carroll in 2011 as alumni director, he was my colleague. He worked right across the hall, which was always crazy to me. I mean, it's Coach DiCarlo. I'm not his colleague, right? I was never comfortable with that dynamic, especially because my office was bigger than his. <laughs> there were times I wanted to apologize, like, Coach, really, we can, we can trade. During those years, as folks on our floor would address him as Tony at you know, division meetings or passing him in the hallway, I would respectfully address him as coach, always. Of course, I had a bit more of a special connection with him, one that dated back to my days as a student athlete. So let me end with this. There was a time early in my playing career, I was a sophomore, when I faced some adversity and coach knew it. He called me into his office, put his arm around me, and shared some thoughts aimed to lift me up. And what he said to me is something that I'll keep between us, but at that moment, it didn't feel like a coach talking to a player, dishing out platitudes and cliches. That really wasn't his style, as you know. I was a place kicker, but it didn't feel like a sports psychologist trying to dive deep into my head and get it fixed. No, it felt more like a father talking to a son, a grandpa talking to a grandson. I would leave that meeting and go on to reach heights I never thought I was capable of on the football field and beyond. To me, that is Coach DiCarlo's legacy. I am his legacy, and so many of you are his legacy. Coach taught us all about loyalty, about leadership, his focus on the small details would add up to have a much larger impact. He instilled a sense of pride and confidence in everyone around him. And this university community is forever indebted to him for his work advancing our alma mater. Thank you. <clears throat> It is now my honor to call to the stage our first speaker, a four-year letter winner, All-American and member of the 1974-75 National Championship Wrestling Team, the only national title in John Carroll history. The banner still hangs in the back. Please welcome Kevin Hinkle from the class of 1977. Thank you. Family and friends of Coach, what an unbelievable tribute yesterday and today. That mass was so, that was beautiful from start to finish. And uh, it's so good to have Tony in my corner here because I now got to do something I don't think I can do yet again. And that face he had, I don't think he was looking at me that time because usually we're happier. 
So my comments are made on behalf of all the wrestlers Tony coached for decades. And if I slip and say I, which I will, I mean we, because I feel how they feel. We don't have to talk about it. We know in our hearts. And being with the 70s football players, I'm bringing you guys in, because I know you felt the same way about Tony as we did. <clears throat> what an unbelievable fraternity he created amongst us wrestlers. Now, albeit, the hazing that went on would be criminal by today's standards. <laughs> you remember, Danny, we were our court jester in the face of John Carroll wrestling to all of us was Tony's main culprit. And, uh, if, if Tony was the king, Danny was the prince in the court jester. And I'm, we're also sorry Danny can't be with us today. They had such a special friendship, and they, and, they always, and they always will. Coach played such an important part in all of our lives and who we all became. Now our wives may say he's got some splaining to do. To Rita and the family, Rita, thanks for sharing Coach all those years. Our four years, we were part of the DiCarlo family, and we never left. You know, there, these people that traveled from out of state because of your sharing with him and the strength and courage you gave him. But over the, we knew Coach was tough and he was strong. There was no doubt about that. I mean, there were battle scars. We'll show a little later. But over the past two years, now I know a primary strength of that courage. And as he battled through his illness, there was nobody that was an advocate like you were. That was where that toughness and strength came from. So on behalf of the wrestlers, we're not blaming you for how hard some of those practices were. <laughs> and to Debbie, Patty, and Tony, thanks so much for sharing your dad when you were young children. Now I'm sure as he came home to those late dinners in a bad mood because there were guys not working very hard or other guys screwing around, I want you to know that bothered me too. And there's some names I'm prepared to share later. <laughs> now, living in Cleveland all these years, guys have come up to me and say, you wear Carroll? Was, was, was Tony a good coach? You know, I knew he won a national championship, and he had a bunch of national champs and a bunch of All-Americans, but was it the talent, or was he a good coach? I'd just smirk, get up. Typically, the response was, wow, I didn't know he was that damn good. <laughs> but what Tony did is Tony revealed talents. In uh, one of the early 70s wrestling team gave him this uh, picture of them on the beach in Florida, and they wrote a note on it that I, I saw that in 1973, and it still sticks in my mind. And what it said, it says, thanks, Coach DiCarlo, for sharing your talents with us to reveal to us our own talents. Like all of you out there, that's what Tony did. That was his business. Whether it was home, the wrestling room, the football field, the tennis courts, we all met Tony when we were 18-year-old boys and left as 22-year-old men. Like that picture over there <clears throat> with, with Tony, this one over here. He was larger than life to us back in the 70s. His leadership caused us to dig deep into ourselves question and develop our own confidence. He had, a, he, had a, he had a GPS for finding a young athlete's talent and, what, and what, what buttons to push. Coach took you as he found you, and he left you better than you were before. And how did he do that? I think how he did it is he so truly believed in his athletes. And think about it, you go through life, who really believes in you? Your parents, your teachers, what gifts teachers are? Some coaches, but not all coaches. Maybe your children. My children believed in me. They believed I could turn a $20 bill into a $100 bill, and my daughter still thinks that. <laughs> but coach could make a wrestler believe in himself that even the most confident guys couldn't believe they could do. He would schedule these Division I schools that were wrestling powerhouses with scholarship kids, and he'd go and he'd convince us we could go out there and compete and we could win. Now, some of our guys had that kind of talent. Now, not me and some of you other guys didn't either, by the way. But we'd go out, and we did. And if we didn't, we, we sure competed. 
in, talked about Tony, Tony in his beautiful eulogy, talked about Coach's life work and his legacy. And I was at a wedding a few years ago, and two brothers were toasting the third brother in a best man speech. And my friend standing there said to his wife, with a tear in her eye, that's our life's work. And they were so proud, as they should be. And certainly Coach's life's work is, you know, together with Rita as his family, and the hundred of us athletes that he coached and others he affected as an athletic director. But I know I can speak for the wrestlers. When we were up in that little hot, sweaty room, Coach taught us to toil and not to count the cost. All of us athletes are part of his life's work. How lucky we all are. And then finally, in conclusion, you know, as I, as I started the remarks, they started with, oh, I know what I can say. Oh, a little part of all of us died today with Coach DiCarlo. And that's trite. And I thought, well, God, if he heard that, he'd quickly retort, Hinkle, I always thought you were a little soft. <laughs> but being with all of you yesterday and today, and many of you for 40 years, listening to the stories, seeing the men he helped form, it got much clearer to me. More than a little part of Tony continues on in each of us. Whether it's a goal in our life or an obstacle to overcome, he taught us to compete and never to give in. Coach, we have and we will. I'm so proud to be with you and to be part of Tony's team. Thank you. Our next speaker is one of the university's finest ambassadors, a past chair and current member of the JCU Board of Directors. He was also a two-sports student athlete in soccer and tennis. During that time, his leadership was already on display as team captain for both programs. Please welcome Dave Short from the class of 1981. Thank you, Dave. I met Tony DiCarlo in 1977, and for the next 41 years, we stayed in touch. And we stayed in touch because that's, what, that's one of the things Tony did so well, is stay in touch with people. So in my attempt to, and it, it is only an attempt, to try to honor Tony, I've organized my thoughts into three parts. I want to talk about Tony as a tennis coach. I want to talk, I'm going to tell you a story. And then I want to talk more broadly about his impact on John Carroll. So Tony, as a tennis coach, I'm sure a lot of you have to be thinking, did he really coach tennis? <laughs> I don't think he really wanted anyone to even know he coached tennis. <laughs> I'm sort of imagining the discussion with the athletic director of him saying, OK, I'll take that job, but let's not announce it. Let's not tell anyone. <laughs> And of course, the reason for that you figured out is he didn't want to show any signs of weakness or softness to the wrestlers or the football players by taking on a sport like tennis. But he bought us new uniforms every year. And in addition to all of that, he didn't really know anything about tennis. I mean, he couldn't tell me that I was dropping my head on my serve and that's why the ball was going in the net. He couldn't tell me to take the ball on the rise. I'm not even sure he knew how to keep score in tennis. <laughs> But he did buy us those new uniforms every year. <clears throat> and they weren't just uniforms. They were shirts, shorts, socks, shoes, warm-ups, and the warm-ups had our names on them. And we looked and felt better than any other tennis team in the President's Athletic Conference when we walked on that court. And that attention to detail mattered to Tony. He knew how to prepare. He knew how to cause you to work hard. He knew how to get individuals to reach deep and why that was important. He knew how to inspire athletes. He knew how to compete. He knew how to win. And one of the reasons he knew how to win is because he knew what winning looked like. And more importantly, he knew what winning felt like. And he could translate that to us, clearly. He knew how to inspire us to be classy, collegiate athletes on and off the court, on and off the mat, on and off the field. So he may not have known much about tennis, but he was an outstanding tennis coach. So the story that I want to tell you about, oh, first of all, I want to tell you that we did see him a different side of Tony, because 
Wrestling season was over, it was springtime, the winter was over, and so I think from our point of view as tennis players, we saw a calmer, a more relaxed, a more reflective, and perhaps an even more philosophical Tony DiCarlo. He asked us a lot of questions. He wanted to get to know us on our terms, and that's how I first met Tony DiCarlo. Um, and so one of my early and, and very clear memories of Tony was how he always brought you, Rita, into the conversation. He frequently and consistently talked about how you played an important role in everything he did in life to include being a coach. And so I remember when we went to the DiCarlo house for our first team dinner that Rita cooked, I remember really looking forward to meeting Rita because the John Carroll giant had an even bigger giant back at his house. So thank you all for sharing him with us. Um, I am certain that the magnitude of sharing him with John Carroll had to have been challenging from time to time because for Tony, he was all in when it came to anything John Carroll. So the story I want to share with you is really just a fun memory of mine, but it's a story with a purpose because it, it reveals some insights as to how Tony operated. We had an away match at Bethany College on a Friday, and I remember I was in the rat bar on Thursday night, the night before, and three of my friends decided they were gonna go to Slippery Rock for the weekend. They didn't have a car, so they were gonna hitchhike. So the four of us walked out of the bar at about 10 o'clock on a Thursday night. I was going to my room to go to sleep, because that's what coach would have expected from us. The other three guys were going to the room to get clothes to start their road trip. And so the next morning, we, we ended up pushing off, and. Um, took off in an absolute downpour in a van. In fact, it was in Tony's van. And just as a quick aside to that, we, we, we drove in Coach's van. It wasn't a John Carroll van. Now remember, Tony and Rita have three kids. They bought a 12-passenger van as their family car. I often wondered how that worked out for you, Tony Jr. You know, you finally turn 16, you go on your first date, and you pick her up in a 12-passenger powder blue van. I'm imagining you didn't have a lot of second dates. Um, <clears throat> So we get in the van, it's pouring down rain, we're driving down 271, I remember sitting in the passenger seat next to Coach and I saw them first, the three hitchhikers. And they weren't hitchhiking at the time because it's pouring down rain, they were under an overpass, trying to stay warm and dry. And I knew we were getting on 480 and they were going to south on 271, so there was nothing we could do for them. And I was just sort of hoping Coach wasn't gonna recognize them when we got up close to them. And of course, when we got close, all three of them had their Aikai coats on, which is the fraternity I was in. And he turned to me and he said, David, weren't, weren't those your friends we just passed? And what the hell were they doing? And I said, yeah, coach, those are my friends. I'm pretty sure they're hitchhiking a slippery rock. And he just shook his head and chuckled like he did and drove on down the road. We got to Twinsburg and he decided he needed to contact the Bethany coast to see what their weather was like. So we pulled off, he found a payphone, called that coach, came back in the van, said they have the same weather, we're canceling this match, we'll reschedule it, we're going back to campus. So of course I'm thinking, oh, Maybe coach will let me off the van and I can go with my friends. And so I asked him with a great deal of hesitation and fear because you never knew how Tony was gonna react to that kind of a thing. And to my surprise, uh, he said yes. And he literally dropped me off on the side of 271 in a sideways <laughs> ring. I mean, imagine doing that today. <laughs> but even imagine doing it then. How many coaches would have done it? But Tony did it and Tony did it because he didn't really follow many of the rules. And I say that as a huge compliment. He didn't follow all the rules because he had a much deeper way of living his life. He had a much richer set of standards that, that, that he lived by rather than just a rule book. And Tony relied on his instincts, his experience, his common sense, his view of right and wrong, his standard of fairness to make his decisions. And it takes a very strong person of character to live their own convictions the way he did. And to me, that was really one of his greatest attributes, was his strength of character. And the lesson in all that for me was it's okay to take some risks and it's okay to trust someone when there's risks inherent. And clearly there are risks inherent, leaving me on the side of 271 at nine o'clock on a Friday morning to, to hitchhike to Slippery Rock. But I applied that principle to my life a lot of ways. I found it particularly helpful as a parent. 
the letting go, the trusting, the trusting that letting go was okay. I used to refer to that principle. I had a lot of Tony DiCarlo principles. I re used to refer to that one as he let me off the side of the road in a rainstorm to go hitchhike to, to, to Slippery Rock principle. That's how I, I thought of it, but it served me well. So let me finish with some quick observations about Tony's impact on John Carroll. And his impact was profound, and that's the right word. And so I can't do this justice in two minutes. But it's important to note that his impact reached far beyond the athletes he coached. And I got a subtle but a powerful reminder of that last week. Because I, like so many of you, sent a bunch of emails out when, when Tony had called and, and informed me of Tony Sr.'s passing. And I want to share with you three of the responses I got back. And these are responses from non-athletes. These were students on this campus 40 years ago who were aware of his presence. And this is how they remembered him. And the first one's just sort of cute. He said, well, he's on the same shuttle as Barbara Bush. Um, the second one, he said, John Carroll is the place we love because of gentlemen like Tony DiCarlo. It's the place we love because of gentlemen like Tony DiCarlo. And the third one said, what a coach, what a mentor, what a man, what a general in the Jesuit army. And Tony wore a different kind of collar but he was a general in the Jesuit army, for sure. So after retiring, he decided he still wanted to help John Carroll, so he took a position in the development office, as Dave mentioned. And if you go to the website today, you'll see that Tony raised in excess of $15 million to support athletic facilities across this campus. He raised an additional $4 million to support scholarships, academic scholarships. He was the vision behind Shula Stadium, and he was the unstoppable force to make sure that thing became a reality. It's now one of the nicest Division III stadiums in the country. He raised the money to bring the, the football team to, to Dublin. He was a force for making John Carroll a better place. And I believe that a school's reputation is, in part, a function of its successes. And one of its successes, of course, has been Tony DiCarlo. And I'm not talking about his success as a three-sport coach or an athletic director. Because I believe his greatest contribution to John Carroll University's reputation was his unbelievable and extraordinary success in generating strength of char character in men and women and sending them out into the world. Um, and I believe that will emerge as his strongest component of his legacy is his strength of character and his ability to impart that on, on those of him around us. So I'll finish by uh, just re referencing the, the habit he was always in of buying new uniforms for his teams. Because to me, there are a lot of lessons in that. And so today, in large part because I think Tony would have expected it from me, I have a new uniform on. This is a new suit, a new shirt, a new tie, and new shoes that I bought on Monday. And I like to have my initials placed on the right side of my suits when I, when I get them. But this time I asked to have Tony's initials placed in my suit. And I asked him to put it on the left side. And so today I have Anthony J. DiCarlo's initials, AJD, in this suit. And I did it on the left side because I want to be reminded every time I put this uniform on that Tony's right here, right here in our hearts. And so our promise, it's not just from me, our promise to you, Rita, Tony, Patty, Debbie, your entire family, is that he will remain in our hearts. And our commitment to you is that we will carry on his legacy, and we are honored to do so. Thank you. I think I mentioned that was one of the finest ambassadors that we have at John Carroll. And I was really hoping he'd tell that slippery rock story. <laughs> that was outstanding. Up next is one of the most decorated players in John Carroll football history. A three-time All-American at linebacker, three-time captain, and member of the JCU Athletic Hall of Fame. He was also a member of the 1989 OAC Championship team, Coach DiCarlo's first as head football coach. Please welcome Dave Rostoka from the class of 1990. Hi, everybody. I'm the emotional one. <laughs> Let me get these. He put Kleenex out here just for me. So first of all, thank you to the DiCarlo family. I'm honored to be here to Aaron and the kids, Mrs. DiCarlo. I can't tell you, um, and you guys know what Coach meant to me. And Tony said, keep it uplifting. So I'm doing my best to keep this uplifting. 
You nailed the eulogy today, too, by the way. That was awesome. It was great. He did. Did a good job? It's an amazing job. So I want to take you back to 1986. I'm a traveling, wandering soul out in the universe. I'm at Bowling Green, as many as my fraternity brothers, football brothers know my story. I'm at Kent State. I'm at Lakeland Community College. And I get home one day, and my dad has an application on Lincoln Electric to be a welder. And I remember thinking to myself, do I want to be a welder? <laughs> I don't want to be a welder. So my high school football coach is Kerry Volkman, who's here today. He sees me out at a local establishment, and we're, we're having a few beers, and we're talking. He's like, what's going on in your life? And I said, you know, I just left Kent State. I'm at Lakeland. I don't know what I want to do. He's like, why don't you come to John Carroll, play football again, and get a good education? And boom, a light bulb goes out, goes off in my head. So I enroll that summer at John Carroll. I get there, Frank Amato is our coach, 1986. I had no idea that the DiCarlo freight train was coming at me a year later. We win two games that year. We hear the rumors that there's going to be a coaching change. And then we hear the rumors that it's going to be Coach DiCarlo, the wrestling coach, is going to take over the, the football program, and he's going to be the new athletic director. Well, I saw a Coach in the hallways from a distance. I never talked to him. And I remember him being just an immense figure, intimidating guy. He always was walking with some type of direction or purpose, you know. He's always intense. So he has our first meeting, and uh, we were excited about his direction. He was very enthusiastic. He set a, a, a strong direction that we're not going to accept losing, and we're going to be champions one day. So I got elected captain in 1987, and he calls for a captain meeting. I was with Mike McGarry in his office. Well, being 19, 20 years old, you talk, remember I talked about that wandering soul. I am in the weight room. The meeting's at 2 o'clock in his office. It's 10 after 2. And one of my friends says, don't you have a meeting with coach? I'm like, oh my gosh. So I run up to his office. I sit down. He nods, looks at me, goes on with his story, his, his agenda for that meeting. And afterwards, he says, OK, that's all I have to say. And uh, we're going to be ready to leave. I get up to go. He said, no, David, why don't you stay back? And I want to talk to you. I'm thinking, maybe he wants me to play a little bit of fullback this year. <laughs> maybe <laughs> no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> maybe he's just going to say, be a really good leader, you're a captain. No, I got my first ass chewing by Coach DeCarl that meeting. Don't ever be late again. And Coach had a way of looking into your soul and just staring at you, and you're just looking at him. He's like, it's a reflection, Dave, of you and also of the team that you're representing. It's a reflection of our program. He goes, you can't be late. And everything that Coach did was always first class, and we know this about Coach. So I left that meeting, and most of the time you leave a meeting like that at 19, like, what a jerk. No, you don't want to ever disappoint that guy again. He had that power over you. And he was always about first class, being professional in everything you do. And we all have that DiCarlo effect. We're all the disciples of DiCarlo's. We're, we are leaders of men, and that's what Coach was to us. And I think he, he always asked the question, if we aren't the best, why aren't we the best? If we don't have the best coaches, why don't we have the best coaches? If we don't have the best facilities, why don't we have the best facilities? And he was a guy that had this vision, but then he made it a reality. So 1987 comes, and we used to have these bright yellow uniforms with a lightning bolt going down our leg, and we had bright yellow helmets. I think they called us bumblebees back then. So he rolls out the Notre Dame blue and gold. We got Las Vegas gold helmets, navy blue shirts, gold pants with JCU, just like Notre Dame had. And we're like, oh my gosh. I'm like, we, we're gonna be good. Just because we got new uniforms, and Dave talked about it, new uniforms. So mentally, we're thinking, this is great. So that, that first year in 87, we win five games. 88, we win seven games. In 89, we're OAC champs. There's no coincidence to why we're the champs, because we had a leader like Coach leading us in everything we did. You know, um, the one thing I want to talk about as well is uh, Coach's voice. You know, we all know the voice. Like, I wasn't there when God handed Moses the Ten Commandments, obviously, on Mount Sinai. But I would have to believe that that voice sounded very similar to Coach DiCarlo. 
because she had this booming, echoing voice. And even in this gymnasium, I can remember when the weather was bad, he would set up those, uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, we had four garbage cans and we'd just do laps around the gym. Now, typically a head coach maybe be off on the side, let the strength coach kind of get you going with your conditioning. Coach would stand in the middle of the gym and he would go, PMA, PAM, PMA, positive mental attitude, OEC champs. And subconsciously he was willing us to be champs. And that was the one thing special about Coach. He had this ability, like Dave said and Kevin said, to take an average athlete and, and, a, and a team that would only won two games and elevate them to a level that we didn't expect we could even get to. But by the time I was a senior, I really thought we could beat anybody in the country because of his leadership. Preparation. You know, I never had a conversation with Coach about luck. But I would have to say that luck would, really wasn't a part of that equation of success. It was always hard work and preparation. That equals success. And we had met an opportunity, like we played Mount Union, that 1989 team. We had hard work, we were prepared. And we walked down that field, and it was no question in our minds that we were gonna beat Mount Union that day. And we beat them 31 to seven. And I remember walking out on the field with Coach DiCarlo and the captains that were with me. It was Joey Bame, Steve Prelock, and Jimmy Mitchell. And we're walking out, and I remember him turning to me, and he said, no matter what happens today, you'll never forget this moment the rest of your life. And I never have. And I remember walking out, we were at Brush Stadium because the field wasn't done yet for Don Shula Stadium. And I looked to my left and all the blue streaks stood up and went crazy. And I saw all the purple on the other side of the sidelines. And that vision will never leave my mind. And he, he had the presence of mind to stop at that moment to tell me and tell all of us, you'll never forget this moment the rest of, the rest of your lives. And, he, and we never did. Um, the one story I want to share with you, too, in 19, um, 1988, Tony and I were captains that year with Tommy Curtis and Jimmy Mitchell, and Coach was so meticulous about being prepared, as you know, and Tony mentioned in his eulogy, he had list for list. Well, that year, every Friday, we would do special teams, and he, for some reason, during that whole course of that season, every Friday, someone wasn't ready. We always had 10 guys out there for field goal or 10 guys out for, for a kickoff. And coach would just be so irate. And he'd be like, who's not out here? So before practice, Tony gets all of us together and he says, hey, listen, it's Friday. I do not want my dad to blow a gasket. He said, please focus this whole practice. And when he calls for special teams, pay attention and make sure that you're ready to go out there. So sure enough, practice goes on. Special teams comes up at the end of practice. They got punt return out there. There's 10 guys. And all of a sudden, coach is like, Who in the who's not out here? And the assistant coach looks up and goes, Coach, it's your son. <laughs> Tony had a run towards coach. And he was putting his helmet on. He was hitting his straight. And we were praying that that size 13 was just going to boot him right in the ass. <laughs> it never happened. Never happened. You're welcome. The, the other thing about Coach, as we all know, and they mentioned, is his vision. His vision was extraordinary. I remember with Ronnie Dolciato, we were graduate assistants, and we used to watch film behind us, which is now the Tom Corbel weight room, and there was three racquetball courts that we used to go and watch film in, and they were dark and dingy and cold. We had a very tiny weight room, and Coach said, we are going to turn this into our weight room. Well, at that age, you can't visualize that, but Coach had that vision. And now as you go behind this wall, if you haven't seen it, it is absolutely immaculate. And that's the first time I think, looking back, what a gift that he had to have that vision. And not only have the vision, but to see that project to completion on a regular basis. We all think about stuff in our lives. We all talk about stuff in our lives, but Co Coach got stuff done. And that's what's the beauty of Coach. I'm going I'm to end with a, a story, and I'm going to read something I wrote to Coach before he passed away. Um, coach loved this story. And this is a side of Coach that when he wasn't coaching and he wasn't in, intense, when he was off the field, um, he, he, last time I was with him, uh, we had lunch together, and he just said, tell the story. And I, what story, Coach? He goes, you know, tell the story. So I'm going to tell the story in honor of Coach. I called Tony's house in 1988. Tony was still living with his parents, Tony Jr. And um, Coach picked up the phone. 
And I was a big prank, prankster, and I still am this today. And I remember saying, um, yeah, hi, this is Bob Murphy from the East Ohio Gas Company. And he goes, oh, really? I go, yeah, um, we have a gas leak in your neighborhood, and we want to make sure that you don't smell any gas in your home. And Coach is like, wait a minute. And he's got that big Italian nose. He's, <laughs> he's just, you can hear him over the phone. And he goes, no, I don't smell any gas. I go, it's not in any other room in the house? She's like, hold on a second. Hey, Rita, do you smell any gas? And she's like, gas? He's like, yeah, there's a gas leak in the neighborhood. And she's like, no, I don't smell any gas. And I said, well, gas has a tendency to rise. So if you get a chair, you can put your nose as close to the ceiling as you can. I go, tell me if you could smell it. And I hear some ruffling going on. And I don't know if he's getting Tony to get up on a chair. But all of a sudden, there's just silence, and it's quiet over the phone. And he goes, is this you, Stokes? <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah. He goes, you're an asshole. And he hangs up the phone on me. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah, he loved that story. There's a couple of them like that. I'm not going to tell the other ones. So I'm going to read. I'm going to get through this, so be patient with me. But just thinking about reading this is going to make me emotional. All right, I'm going to do it. I wrote this, and I think this captures with all of us what he meant. So when I say I, like Kevin said, we're talking about it's we. And I think this meant, uh, all, this, this captures everything about coach and, and how he changed us into leaders of men. So it goes like this. As I lay here in my bed, I say the rosary for coach, my coach the man who inspired me to be a leader, to be the person I could be, to always have a positive attitude no matter how bad the circumstances, and to carry myself with class even in difficult situations. Coach, you truly changed my life in every possible way. In 1986, before you took over the program, we won two games. And then under your leadership, virtually with the same players, we won five games in 1987, seven games in 1988, and then we won the OEC championship in 1989 with a 9-1 record. We were the first football team in JCU history to go to the NCAA playoffs, and we beat Mount Union that year 31-7. I look back at those teams in those years, and I realize that having a positive mental attitude and a strong belief in ourselves and the guys around us is what made us better players, but more importantly, better men. You, coach, changed our lives and how we thought about ourselves. You made, us first class, you made us a first class program with a first class mindset. By the time I was a senior, I truly felt that no one can beat us. We fought to the end during every single game, which was a testament to your fighting spirit. I carry your life lessons with me every single day. Doing things the right way, never taking shortcuts, believing in myself and working harder than anyone else. Those, these are the lessons that I live by, all because of your influence in my life. I'm not who I am today without you, Coach. I thank you and I love you from the bottom of my heart. We will carry on your legacy from here, Coach. Rest your mind, body, and soul. I love you and I thank you, Stokes. Thank you very much, everybody. We are delighted to have our next speaker back on campus. A four-year starter at quarterback and two-time All-American who rewrote the John Carroll record books for passing, landing him in the JCU Athletic Hall of Fame. He was also a two-time captain and would go on to play in the NFL for the Indianapolis Colts and the Green Bay Packers before, of course, returning to John Carroll to begin his coaching career and later on leading the Blue Streaks to the outright 2016 OAC Championship. He is currently the head coach at Chattanooga. Please welcome Tom Arth from the class of 2003. Oh boy, this is uh, 
Tony, appreciate you putting me in the order uh, where I did and the people I have to follow. Um, but, uh, geez, oh man, um, it's just, it's such an incredible, incredible honor um, to be here um, and to be, have been asked uh, to be a part of this occasion. Um, I cannot tell you what that meant to me. Um, and to see everybody here, um, it just, you know, thank you. You know, thank you for being here. And I think I have a little bit of a different perspective um, than our first four, you know, including Dave, um, you know, our first four speakers. Um, I did not have the opportunity to play for Coach DiCarlo. Um, Coach DiCarlo was the athletic director uh, when I arrived here in John Carroll, at John Carroll in, 19, in 1999. Um, but I knew who he was, um, and I knew what he represented. Um, and that always meant so much to me. And before, you know, before I begin, I just, I want to thank the DiCarlo family. I want to thank Mrs. DiCarlo especially um, for, for what you've given to John Carroll. And I think that, you know, in my profession as a coach, um, I think I understand um, in a different way uh, what you've gone through in your years, um, supporting your husband and supporting John Carroll University and um, the sacrifices that you've had to make. You know, we as coaches, we make sacrifices, but it's what we love. It's what we dream about doing. It's what we wake up excited to do every single day. You didn't necessarily choose that life, um, but you allowed your husband to be the man that, he, that all of these individuals are talking about and the men that the reason why everybody's here today and the thousands more uh, people, the lives that he's touched in incredible ways. So thank you so much um, for everything that you've done for all of us and for John Carroll University. And, and Tony, um, thank you as well um, for calling me and um, you know, for sharing your dad, Patty and, and Debbie, um, for sharing your dad with all of us. Um, you know, the sacrifices that you've made um, you know, in your father's time and away from you. And um, he was an incredible example to me, um, an incredible example to me and an incredible inspiration to me as a father as well and how he involved you all in his career um, and in this university is, is, truly, is truly inspiring. So thank you so much um, for having me here, uh, for having me be a part of this. And I have to say, when, when Tony called me a couple weeks ago and said you know, that, that his father was, you know, was starting, you know, wasn't eating and things like that, and um, you know, it was probably you know, the end was coming soon. And um, you know, he said, we'd like you to be here if you're able to be here. And, you know, don't want to put any pressure on you, you know, to be here. But, you know, of course, there was no doubt that I would be here. Never a doubt in my mind um, that I would be here for this. Um, but, you know, I hung up the phone and started thinking, you know, what, how, how am I going to, you know, spend five to ten minutes talking about, you know, Coach DiCarlo and his life and his impact, you know, the impact that he's made on this university, the impact that he's made on the lives of so many people, life-changing impacts that he's made. Like, how, what, what are the words that are going to do that man justice? What are the words um, that are going to honor his family in the right way? And what are the words that, you know, and what is the message that's going to reach the student athletes that are here, that they understand what Coach DiCarlo represents, the man that he is, what he gave to this school, you know, and that that carries on, not just with us that had the opportunity to be around him, but to every generation of future John Carroll students who walk through these doors, that they know what he is. And, you know, you go through it and, you're, and, and over the last, you know, week and a half or so, you know, I'd find myself just jotting notes down in my notebook, just things would come into my head about, you know, just different things that I could talk about. And we've heard so many words you know, so many words that represent Coach DiCarlo and that describe Coach DiCarlo, the person that he was. And I'm sure that some of the people that have worked for him might have a few other words, um, some descriptive words um, as well for Coach. Um, but he held people to that standard. Um, he held people to his standard, nobody else's. And that's why this place is what it is. And, you know, going through that and thinking, you know, words like, you know, loyal, passionate, loving, tough, competitive, inspirational, intelligent, you know, all these words that we've heard over and over again, you know, when you say them individually, 
you know, they don't do it justice. No matter how articulate, no matter how beautifully you package them together, they're never going to do the man justice. And, you know, I thought about it for me. And, you know, it really hit me as I was traveling here and I was going back through my notes and really finalizing what I wanted to say and what I wanted to share with all of you. And it really just hit me that what Coach DiCarlo has left behind, you know, his legacy is pride in John Carroll University. That's what he's meant to me. As somebody who watched him, as somebody who you know, felt his presence on our campus as a student and as an athlete here, you know, be having the opportunity to become the head coach at John Carroll and to follow in his footsteps. That was a, that was a weight that I shouldered every single day and an obligation that I felt every single day to live up to his legacy, to give him a program, something that he could be proud of, something that he built here, and something that we strove every single day to carry on and to carry forth. And that, to me, was his legacy and is his legacy. And you think about it, and you know, it's, it's become so real for me in, in, in being gone for a year. And having the opportunity to come back yesterday, um, you know, it hit me. You know, every day, every day that I coached here, and I woke up, and I got to walk to work, because I lived close the last couple years, you know, you feel something special. You feel something special when you see, when you, every time, every one of us that set foot, foot on this campus, you feel something different. You feel something unique. And when you look at the Griselli Tower, you see something special. When you walk into Shula Stadium, when you walk into the wrestling room and you read the names, the All-Americans, when you have the opportunity to go to a John Carroll football game and you see the way the sun glistens on that gold helmet, like all of those feelings, all of those emotions that you have in you, those are real, and they're real because there was a man who gave his life, who gave his love, who poured his heart out every single day for 50 years. Poured his heart out every day for 50 years for this university so that we can have those memories, so that we can have those experiences. And that's what I cherish above everything else that Coach DiCarlo has done for me because this school means the world to me. It always has and it always will. And it does because of Coach DiCarlo, because of what he's meant, because of what he's built here. And we all know the stories that we tell, the people who we talk about, they're all connected in some way to Coach DiCarlo. It's, I got off the airplane. I got off the airplane yesterday and I'm walking through, I'm walking through the, the terminal and I look to my right and I see a billboard uh, advertisement for ThunderTech, Jason Therian's company. Jason played, uh, was a member of Coach DiCarlo's, uh, the final football team that he coached here. You know, and then I'm down and I'm picking up my bags and baggage claim and I see world headquarters of duct tape, duck brand duct tape. And I think about the impact that Coach DiCarlo has made on that company and that organization. And we all know that. This place is what it is because of Coach DiCarlo. And that's his legacy is the feeling that we have inside of us, the feeling that we have, the pride that we have when we say we went to school at John Carroll University. I know I hold my head up high when I say that, and I know it means something to me, and I know it means something to the people that I say that to because they know about John Carroll University because of Coach DiCarlo, because of what he built here. And I ask each of you, I ask each of you that when you have those moments of pride, when you have those feelings, inside of you of John Kerry University that you think about Coach DiCarlo and you think about what he gave to this school and the legacy that he left behind. And remember him and be thankful um, for that most precious gift. Um, thank you all so much um, for being a part of, of, of his life, uh, for being a part of all of our lives and being an inspiration um, to all of us who, uh, you know, who have been a part of this program. And, um, I thank you, and, and God bless Coach DiCarlo.
we end our program with a special member of the DiCarlo family. A current student and former student athlete, he is someone of which the entire family is proud and perhaps nobody more than his grandpa. Please welcome Derek Name from the class of 2018. So Coach Arth complained about his spot in the order. Yeah, imagine what I'm dealing with right now. Um, my mom cried at the first parent meeting that Coach Arth led, so that just goes to show you what I kind of, the shoes I kind of got to fill. But kind of the difference for me, I kind of have a different story than all of them because, you know, all the speakers came up here today. He was, he was Coach DiCarlo to them, but to me, he was just Grandpa DiCarlo. From the day I was born, I, you know, I was around this place from sidelines at football games to running away from that scary wolf mascot that's still kind of creepy to this day. Um, and my dad would take me into the Shula room with the rest of my brothers and say, look, I wore number three, my number's retired here. And then that jersey would flip around the backside and we realized it said Fletcher on the back of it. <laughs> and so then he had a decent amount of time trying to describe that his nickname was actually, actually Fletch in college. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm buying that anymore, but that, that's the story. But the countless amount of sporting events I went to from wrestling matches to football games, just I was around this university. I remember trips to Shula Stadium, and it just, it never registered to me what my grandpa had truly done at this place. Um, to me, you know, he was just Grandpa DiCarlo. Grandpa DiCarlo to me was a man who loved his family more, and John Carroll more than anything in the world. He made sure things were done the right way, every time, no matter what. He even yelled at me one time for burning my hand on his lawnmower and asked me if I learned anything in school. Um, and if there's one thing you knew about Coach DiCarlo, he loved to golf. And particularly, he hated slow golfers. From the time I was about five years old, my grandpa used to pick me up and take me to the driving range. And you know, he taught me everything I know from how to respect the game, how to respect the course, how to respect the other people that you're golfing with. And for those of you who don't know, in his later days of life, Coach DiCarlo, Grandpa DiCarlo to me, could play 36 holes of golf in one day and not be sick of it one bit. And then he would go home, eat dinner that my grandma would make for him, and then head back out to the course to play all the holes that he didn't play well on. One of the biggest lessons he taught me when it came to golf is, it's never your fault, it's always your clubs. And that's Coach DiCarlo. That man went through more golf clubs than I ever could have imagined. But it worked out well for me because he just passed them all down to me. On a serious note, though, he taught me the right way to play the game. He taught me all the etiquette and about respect. That is one thing that my, my grandpa really taught us about. I think in all my years, I never officially beat my grandpa to Carlo in golf. When I was younger, he was just hands down a better golfer than me. And then I, as I got older, it was right around the time his memory was starting to go. And let me tell you, you know Coach is competitive. He'd use that to his advantage. So all of a sudden, those sixes out on the course were becoming fours on the scorecard. And I couldn't correct them. Like, I just didn't have it in me. <laughs> As I approached my college choice, my grandpa obviously had his favorite. But I always told myself, you know, I grew up around this place. I want to do something different. I want to go somewhere else. Poor, Co poor, poor Coach Ars, from the day he was hired, probably got a call from my grandpa once a day saying, get Derek to John Carroll. Do whatever you got to do to get Derek to John Carroll. Well, it worked. And I'll never forget the look on his face and that hug he gave me when I walked into the kitchen and said, I'm going to be a blue streak. That day kind of changed my life forever. The day I stepped onto campus, I knew I had made the right choice. From day one, Coach Art started speaking about the legacy that my grandpa had on this team. I have one vivid memory that kind of sticks out to me. And it was one day after practice, grandpa came to speak in fall camp. And each player, one by one, all 150 members personally went up to my grandpa after practice to thank him for what he did. And I remember being at the end of that line, all 150 people later, and I gave him a hug. And he looked at me and he said, I am so proud of you. There are certain things that will just stick to you for the rest of your life. <clears throat> and then I also remember some speeches that Coach Cochran used to give. Um, I'm sure all you former football players out there know the Cochran speech. You know, it talks a lot about John Carroll and what it means to be at John Carroll. Also, how to dump your high school girlfriend because she's not worth your time anymore. And I would love to play for part of that speech right here for you, but let's just say it was a special locker room edition. Um, but in this speech, he discussed what it meant to be a man of Carroll and what it means to put on that gold helmet and what that really represents. That moment for me was when it really came together of what my grandpa did. 
Through my time at Carroll, I've had countless alumni and faculty come up to tell me stories of what my grandpa DiCarlo did. I finally understood why Coach DiCarlo was just as great as Grandpa DiCarlo. When it came to football, I've been so blessed to have two head coaches in Coach Arth and Coach Venati who understand the meaning of being a man of Carroll. These men carried on his legacy, and I know he is so proud of both of them. Kind of a funny story. I remember one time my sophomore year, it was a JV game, and my grandpa DiCarlo had come to it. And he came down on the field after the game, and I remember one of the players, not knowing he was my grandfather, goes, wow, Coach DiCarlo came to a JV football game. How cool is that? <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, you know what? He loves John Carroll, but I don't know if he loves it that much. And let me tell you, through my time here at John Carroll, I never took for granted putting that, that gold helmet on one time. And what that meant for our family, but most importantly, what that meant to him. I'll never forget the first time I got to my locker, saw my jersey sitting in it with a TD patch on the chest. That was my grandpa. I've never been so proud in my entire life. I always remember how proud I was to play in that jersey with his initials. I'll never forget running out of the tunnel, and for those of you who played in the last few years, he was the last person whose hand you'd shake as you ran out in the field because he would stand there one by one shaking all of our hands. I remember conditioning in the off season in the DiCarlo Varsity Center right here. T-Rob, our strength and conditioning coach, was about to run us into the ground, running back and forth in this damn gym. And I remember looking up at that name right above me right there and realizing why I did this. I also even had the opportunity, I'm not sure he's so proud of me on this one, of staring at his name while I was fighting off my back in the JCU Open that I had to wrestle in after I lost my fantasy football league. But uh, yeah, so I can say I played football and I wrestled here at John Carroll, I guess. But to be honest with you, I've just been blessed to spend four years with the greatest teammates, coaches, and community there is. I take pride in knowing my grandpa DiCarlo helped shape this place. Besides God, there are two things that my grandpa DiCarlo loved more than anything. John Carroll and his family. Those are the two reasons why he turned down the head coaching job at Michigan, because he didn't want to move his family and he loved John Carroll. To this day, I have no idea why he did that, but I could tell you he wouldn't change it for the world. And to be honest with you, thank God he didn't or else I probably wouldn't exist to this day. <laughs> but John Carroll and family, those two meant the same thing to him. In his mind, John Carroll and family meant the same thing. He would give anything to help any single one of you out there, and you all know that, just like he would his own kids. And speaking of family, there's one lady who coached DiCarlo couldn't have done it out, my grandma Rita. She was his rock. The way she stood by my grandpa's side the last few years was just absolutely inspiring. There is nothing that she wouldn't do for him. She has been such a great example to me and my cousins of what true love really looks like. In those final days, I was able to go over there and talk with him. Even though he couldn't talk a lot, you knew he was still listening. I would stand by his bedside and talk about the accomplishments from all of you guys out there, from current players to former players to Mason McKendrick, who's right now trying to make it in the NFL. Sometimes it would bring a tear to his eye, other times he would smile, and even if you're Mr. Stoka, you get a fist pump or something like that. Although my grandpa is no longer here, his legacy lives on in each and every one of you. His time here after 77 years is done. But let me tell you, he touched more lives in those 77 years than we could ever dream of. Now it's your turn to continue that legacy and show the world what it means to be a man of Carroll and how special this John Carroll community is. At this time, can I have my cousins please come up around the stage with me? I didn't tell you I was gonna do this, so I'm getting a lot of bad looks right now. But if you guys could just come up here. Yeah, I'm definitely getting heat for this one after this. But anyhow, no, you, could just, you, guys, you guys can just stay right there. But I wanted to bring that up because on behalf of the family, you know, we cannot thank you guys enough for everything that you've done this past week. You know, to, to Sue Lender, Dave Vitito, and Jane Evans, to Gene Collar, and everyone at this university, you've seriously made these past few days special for our family. We can't thank you enough for the stories you guys have shared over the past few days, and these memories are gonna stick with us for the rest of our lives. On behalf of Rita, Tony Jr., Debbie, Patty, and the rest of the family, thank you, we love you, go Blue Streaks, and onward on.
How about one more round of applause for all of our speakers? You guys were amazing. I, um, I too, wanted to recognize uh, those here on campus that helped pull this off. <laughs> it was uh, a, a huge effort. So our friends in facilities and IT and catering and obviously athletics, campus security, um, our friends at JZU, uh, the advancement division, of course. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Everybody chipped in. And a round of applause for all of you who are here. I'd like to thank our volunteers, most of whom are current members of the football and wrestling teams. Uh, young men, please raise your hands. Incredible. Incre thank you all. And we thank your coaches, Coach Rick Fanati, Coach Mark Haywall. Thank you uh, for carrying on the tradition of, of Coach DiCarlo. Round of applause for you two as well. All right, I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to ask for those who can, please stand. We're going to end in a very special way today. We will end with a tribute to Coach DiCarlo, the ultimate winner. And as the amazing nurses that cared for him will tell you, an extraordinary fighter. It seems only fitting that we join together to sing our fight song. So please pick up your programs. The lyrics are in there. Maybe it's been a few years for some of the guys from the 80s and 70s. And when we hit play on the recording, you'll hear a whistle blow. There'll be about 20 seconds of musical intro. And at that point, look for my cue. And I invite all of you to sing as loud as you can for Coach. OK, everybody got it? Look for my cue and join in after about 20 seconds. All right, hit it. <laughs> Thank you. 